please help me welcome uh, Jack Welch, Susie Welch, and Vivek Paul. Susie and Jack, welcome to Tycon. Thank you. I thought that uh, everyone knows that, Jack, you've been a great CEO. <laughs> but what they don't know is that uh, about your experience as a founder and entrepreneur. You are credited with creating the plastics business in GE, as well as my favorite, the CT business. And both businesses went on to become multi-billion dollar businesses. What advice do you have for all of the people here who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs inside their own companies? Well, just be sure. Good, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here. It's, it's awfully nice of you to be here so early. Uh, let, let me say that the number one thing you do in any startup is grab the great people. It's all about people first to drive that idea home. People with passion, people with energy, but people, people, people. And as an entrepreneur, whether you're inside a company or outside, getting talent is a real key to growing your in endeavor. So, uh, you know, while that's great, uh, a friend of mine was uh, sharing the story with me that, uh, you know, his company has this innovation program to try and create this internal entrepreneurship. And he says the way it works is you make these great presentations to management and the CEO, and a few days later, the finance guy comes along and says there's no budget. And it feels like, Corporate America is really losing out on this ability, and honestly, there are very few examples, Jack, since the plastics and CT, maybe Gorilla Glass, of US corporations actually building great businesses from inside. It's all acquisition. Yeah, with, with, without question, the 2008 recession really put a crimp in, in a lot of activities, and people are trying to do more with less. That's the common theme you see everywhere you go, more with less. And that's a, a, fa that's a design failure that is gonna hurt us long term. And so without question, the nice thing about the people in this room, you're filled with talent and credentials. And you, you can find yourself always in the right place because you have the mobility and the brain power. There's nothing like Indian entrepreneurs. There's nothing like it. And you have a chance to take that skill wherever you find the right environment. You shouldn't wait a month in a bad environment, in a non-creative, non-supportive environment, because you've got the stuff that makes companies hum. I've seen that all my life. Of course, I'm a huge fan of Indian entrepreneurs. I've been going there for 25, 30 years. I love the energy, the brains. I always said, we went to India to find low cost. Instead, we found high brains, many, many brains. And that changed the game. And so that's why I'm such a huge fan of India, and I think you all know that. So, uh, Susie, uh, your thoughts on this, uh, you know, uh, corporate America missing out on uh, being able to create entrepreneurship uh, inside the company? The problem with uh, corporate America as we see it as we travel around and as we are uh, reporting and writing the book is that corporate America has a thousand different ways to say no. And entrepreneurs are yes people. You know, how can we uh, get it done? I mean, it's, we, we heard about this fabulous conference about two weeks ago. Jack heard about it when he was speaking at Harvard Business School. And I mean, uh, a connection was made and the answer was yes, let's see how we can make it happen. That's how entrepreneurs think. And so when you have an entrepreneurial spirit and you're within a corporation that has all the machinery in the world um, to say no a thousand different ways. And look, frankly, if you're a yes person, and you're in a no organization, you got to get out. And that's probably why a lot of you have gone and started your own things, because you're yes people. And I don't know if that culture can be changed. I mean, that really puts the onus on, on, on top management in corporate situations to ask the organization, can we have a culture of yes? And it doesn't happen very often. That's a great way to think about it. Yes organizations or no organizations. So, Jack, let me pick up on this theme of India. So uh, I had the uh, privilege of actually escorting the very first 
CIO group that went to India to look at outsourcing for GE. This was in 1989, ages both. So, uh, you know, what made you get excited about India? Because clearly they were there because Jack Welsh sent them. Right. Well, I, I went to India in, uh, in the 80s and I met some fabulous people there. Uh, KP Singh, a variety of people, introduced me to all the government officials. Uh, Mohammed Singh, the, the Prime Minister eventually was sitting, was living, he was out of power, and he was li living in a little uh, white house in Delhi. And we went over and sat on his porch and drank some liquid, I don't know what it was. <laughs> and, uh, and we sat there and chatted and he was the most beautiful man. I, I, I felt such peace with him and such vision. And we, we became enchanted with the place and then we started meeting people and going back and back and we kept meeting smarter people and smarter people. And we met Azim Premji who became a close friend and partner. He stole my friend Vivek. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, but it was a wonderful thing for Vivek and for Premji and for GE. And we formed the basis of a deal with him. Uh, we met Hasmuk Shah, all these people that just kept helping us participate in the Indian economy and the Indian intellectual idea. I think the thing that I found, as I said before, I couldn't believe the intellectual capacity of India. And that to me was the, the miracle I found. And I, everybody I met was smarter than the person I just met. And it kept going on and on and on. Like today, I was standing out back here with some, some entrepreneurs and I said to them, uh, have you got your own company? Oh no, I've already sold three. <laughs> you know, I love it. It's, it's in the gene. Smart, aggressive, uh, courteous, and yet aggressive. Always, always searching. I, I'm actually a romantic about India, so I apologize for being up here. Uh, I'm basically an Indian salesman. <laughs> because I, I truly believe in the place. Thank you. So uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I remember one of the things you did was force every GE business to have an India strategy. Yep. And I think that as the things have turned out, I think Indians have had more impact on the world than India has. And hopefully, you know, India does fulfill its <laughs> full potential. So, so let me switch back to, the, uh, to Silicon Valley here. Yeah. And uh, unicorns, as you know, are venture-funded startups that get valued at over a billion dollars. Yes. And they were so rare that they were practically mythical, which is why they're called unicorns. But today, we have herds of unicorns yeah. galloping between San Francisco and Santa Clara. So are we in a different technology age or an age of folly? No, I think we're in a different technology age. Just so Susie and I wanted to describe that last night at the bar at the Four Seasons. Yeah, yeah well, uh, Jack and I have spent the uh, past few days in Silicon Valley. Uh, we spent a day at Google, spoke at the Googleplex, got a tour of the place, saw the, uh, I tried Google Glass. We had all sorts of experiences there. And we spent a day at LinkedIn meeting with their team. And uh, we're beginning to feel that we were a little bit, you know, we were sort of caught up in the fervor and excitement of Silicon Valley. Well, then uh, last night we uh, were having a late dinner. Uh, we went and spoke someplace, and we were having a late dinner at the bar at the Four Seasons. And uh, we sit down next to a banker and a young Silicon Valley entrepreneur type and an early investor in Uber. And we got caught up in this like whirlwind of a conversation. Afterwards, I said to Jack, we couldn't live here. Our heads would explode. I mean, the guy was just talking about who was undervalued, who was overvalued, what technology was coming, who was going to wipe out who, who was going to buy who. I mean, it is this, it, we were like, you know, when, it's not like Jack is a faint of heart, but our heads were like, and I think there's a whole valley of people like this. Um, the thing to remember, um, because the first part of this book tour, we went through the Rust Belt, and we were in Cleveland and Kansas City and Minneapolis and places where this is a mythical place because th these are people who are struggling mightily, um, who are you know, cutting back and who don't have this sense of wonder and enchantment and they're not part of this economy. So there really are these two different worlds. Look, we love it here. I mean, it's fantastic. 
um, and very, very exciting. And when we were at the Microsoft conference for the past three days in Seattle, we saw um, the demonstration of some technologies that were, <clears throat> that were mind blowing. Who's to say? What's so, real and what's not. That's great. It's very reassuring that we're not in this age of folly because it does feel like so many industries, we thought the change was over and it just goes on goes and on. on and on. And, and, the, and the difference between now and 2000 is these companies have real cash flow, real disruption. They're, in, they're entering large markets with their disruption. Uh, if you think about the transportation business and Uber, it's enormous. So they're not follies. They're not just apps. Great. So uh, I'd like to remind the audience that you can text the letter D, as in David, to 408-650-5040, and I will get your questions. And assuming uh, that they're interesting questions, I will ask them. So uh, Susie and Jack. Uh, you, and you'll be the judge of this? I will be the judge, the sole judge. Uh, yeah, I don't get to show you anything until I decide. No, I mean, uh, you're going to judge their questions. Yeah, uh, sadly, that's my job. So both of you have uh, you know, done a phenomenal job in terms of both writing a book that's been number one in all the best yeah. lists, bestseller lists. And I believe you're giving all the proceeds to charity? Yes. Yeah, this is our third book, and we give them all to inner city scholarships. Right. And it's been very successful so far. So, so real life MBA. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So let me take an opposite view on that, Good. which is uh, one of my VC friends told me that they'd rather have a PhD than an MBA. They said, superficialists, dime a dozen, it was Jack the PhD that built the plastics business. So if somebody in this audience or anywhere wanted to go for advanced studies, PhD or MBA? Well, that's totally dependent on the personality and, and the ambition. I mean, uh, obviously a, a PhD in technology today is a ticket to the moon. So let's face it, that's a great game, but you also are very blessed to have an MBA that can teach you how to build beyond the incubator stage to the next stage, build great teams, build momentum, understand how to hire, fire, uh, motivate, allocate re re resources, the stage two and three, if you will, of the venture. Uh, so it depends on your personality. Some people can't stand managing, they hate it. Some people like to just come up with the idea, drive it home, spin the company, and get on with the next one. It's a totally individual characteristic. I mean, it depends. If you, want, if you want to be an individual contributor, by all means, go get that PhD. I mean, as Jack is, of course, right, the world belongs to you. But you know, the moment when you have to start managing people, that's the moment of truth. And, 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 and there is this moment where an individual contributor who's been raising his or her hand and getting all the answers right becomes a manager of people. And in that moment, that's the hardest transition and that's where organizations can live or die is when you realize it's not about you anymore. It's about the reflected glory of your people, the people around you. And that's where learning about people management, which is not a natural skill for many people. I mean, I think actually for Jack, managing people was quite much part of his DNA, but it's not for everybody. And, and that's where learning how to do that really comes in uh, handy, very helpful. So I think your book has a whole section on uh, you know, how do you manage uh, right. organizations, right. And manage people, so that's great. But one of the other sections that really intrigued me was a section on crisis management. Yep. And uh, California is facing a water crisis, uh, and yet the response so far has been completely defeatist. An equivalent would be a CEO facing a revenue shortfall, and then deciding not to look for any alternate sources, cutting everybody's budget equally without thought about investment or disinvestment. And that's exactly where we are in California. Jack, how would you deal with California's water crisis? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Welch did not bring up a fool. <laughs> and as a result of that, I've, I've looked at this water crisis. You had it in the mid 70s, you had it in the mid 80s. You had a 200 year drought a hundred year, years ago, uh, 200 years ago. So this is a problem that's been around forever and nobody wants to face it. California has to face it. They have to be transparent about it. They've got to get, I don't know the answer. I'm not, I've, I've read enough papers on the way out here. I've had a briefing on the South subject and I don't have the answer. I just don't, but I'll tell you this, there's got to be transparency. There's got to be an argument between the inner part of the state and the coast, 
There's got to be a big debate, and people have got to go at it in a much more transparent way than they are now. Now it's a group of uh, politicians dealing with special interests, dealing with each niche. That isn't going to work long, long term. Now, each time the crisis has come, it's been solved by nature. 70s, 80s, and now let, let's hope that happens again right now because it doesn't seem like anybody's taking the, the transparent, head-on position on the subject. Jack and I were very struck when I think, I'm not sure, so I think it was the governor who said, I'm not going to pick winners and losers in this water crisis. In other words, I'm not going to pick which industries get nailed. Uh, you know, almonds, yes, and avocados, no, or whatever. And I think I read that headline out loud to Jack, and, and we both agreed, well, what does a leader do if a leader does not pick winners and losers? And so it's, a, it's an interesting inability to, uh, you know, when you are, when you don't have the courage to pick winners and losers in a crisis situation, you'll you'll live to regret it. No, I think certainly the current situation just feels like uh, needs a little bit of management. Yep. So, you know, coming back to the uh, topic of uh, career management that you have in your book, yep. you talked about managing your career and avoiding career purgatory. Uh, what are the top three things that you think, you know, folks in the room ought to start doing? Because that was pretty compelling about just status quo is dangerous. Well, I mean, we talk a lot about career pur purgatory, and I don't think anybody in this room who's hungry for a education, hungry to grow, hungry to make connections, is in career purgatory. But if you are, the thing you have to do is you have to set, set a timetable. If you're stuck with a bad boss, or you're stuck in a low growth situation, you've got to set a timetable. How long am I going to stay? I'm going to stay a year. I'm going to stay six months, I'm going to stay 18 months, whatever it is. But while you're there, you can't act like you're in the purgatory. You can't be negative, you can't be whispering, you can't be gossiping, you can't be, you've got to over deliver. That means do more than is asked of you. Do more than your boss asks you. Every meeting has got to be you in a positive energy, showing your boss a new perspective on the issue. Broader, bigger. I, I always had a rule. Whenever I had a meeting with a boss, make sure the boss left the meeting smarter than when they entered. Think of that every time you're in a meeting. Are you adding perspective? Now, if that doesn't work, get the hell out of there. Okay, but go to the meeting. Don't, don't get into career pur purgatory and fall into that negative attitude. Set a timetable, give it your 150%, and then if it doesn't work, know you've given it the time, move on. <clears throat> Excuse me, move, move on. Sometimes people are in a career purgatory um, and are blocked from moving up um, because of their own underperformance, okay? And what happens in that situation most of the time is um, a silent freeze where the person, you, sense that there's something wrong with your performance, and the boss, because bosses tend to be this way, don't tell you what you're doing wrong. They're sort of a passive aggressive, they don't want to be mean, they blah, 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 and they don't say anything. And so you're in a silent um, locking of horns where you're not moving and you don't know why. And that we feel on the part of the boss, that's morally wrong. We believe every boss has a moral obligation to let every person know where they stand. And we've traveled a lot from the past. 10 years, we've traveled around the world, we've talked to about 1.25 million people, and in groups small and large, we've asked the question, how many of you know where you stand? And we're lucky if we get 10% of the people raising their hands. It is an epidemic, okay? Actually, we were at Google the other day, and we asked, we got the most hands we've ever seen, 60% of the people in the room, it's a well-managed company, uh, uh, said they knew where they stood. But when that happens and you suspect your performance, and that's a very hard thing to admit to yourself, that some of it, the blocking, some of the purgatory is about you. you have a, if you have a boss who's not going to tell you what's going on, you need to initiate that conversation and say, what am I doing well and what can I do better? As, as painful and as awkward as that conversation feels like it's going to be, um, that is the first step to changing the dynamic. Now, now re recognizing that many of you here have your own companies or have started companies, et cetera, how many of you, let, let's just try it here. Who work for someone. How many of you who work for an organization know in the relationship with your leader where you stand, what your career trajectory is, what your expectations are, and what you think your next move will, will be? How, how many, could you ra ra raise, your ra raise your hand? Please raise your hand. 
It's frightening. Yeah, 10% maybe. 50. That is the problem in corporate America right now. Do you realize in corporate America, and now I'm not talking Silicon Valley, Gallup runs a poll every quarter. 12,000 people are polled randomly. And they're asked, how engaged are they in their work? Do they like their work? A series of questions. The poll says 65% of American workers are disengaged in their job, not in love with the job. Well, one of the things you have as a responsibility in your jobs as leaders, you've got to become the chief meaning officer. You've got to give meaning and purpose to every person who works for you. You've got to tell them why they're there, where we're going, why we're going there, and what's in it for them if they get there. That is your job, to engage them, get in their skin, turn them on. And that is a huge responsibility you have. And too many companies have people just coming to work, getting a check, and hating the job. 65%, if you believe that business is a game and the team with the best players wins, imagine having going to a game, a soccer game, or any game. I guess a cricket game, right? <laughs> if you were going to any game and 65% of your team stayed on the sidelines, you wouldn't have a hell of a good chance of winning. That's what the problem is in corporate America. It's a brutal problem of engagement. People feel disillusioned from 2008. Now that's not true here perhaps, but the fact that not enough people here know where they stand is frightening. It's frightening. Everyone should know where they stand. If not, they should go in and find out where they stand. So, so Jack, uh, it's really amazing to see how much passion you have in the area of helping people get in through their career. The work that you did at GE in terms of management development is legendary. And yet, at the same time, you have also a reputation of being a really hard-nosed manager cutting a lot of jobs. Yep. Do you see that as a paradox, an evolution, or you cannot do one without the other? Look, didn't I just say the team with the best players wins? Well, sometimes you don't have the best players. And you've got to be able to differentiate. A, a great manager or a good manager has what we call a generosity gene. It's something that my wife will argue there's no such thing as a gene. I'm not sure it's a gene. <laughs> but basically, this is a gene where you as a leader Make your place, your little group, your large group, whatever, the place to be. The, we used to call, we, we like to call it the cool kids basement in, in high school where everybody wants to hang out. You want your place to be the place in your organization where the good players want to come and play, where you give credit for them, where you get excited to give them raises, where you get excited to give them stock, equity, where well, you get excited for their success. It turns you on. The biggest success I have in my life is that over 50 uh, CEOs today in large American corporations work for me. And whether it be Vivek or lots of other people, that's the success. And whether it's Boeing or Home Depot or, or Honeywell or all these companies, that's the turn on. You as a leader have got to get turned on by the success of your people. You've got to engage them, love them. And then if they don't deliver, always tell them where they stand. And if they're not delivering, you have to ask them to move on. But that's part of the job. This idea of I'm too kind a manager to tell somebody they're not acting right, they're not doing well. That's not kind, that's cruel. Because when a recession or difficult times come, you walk down the hall, the boss has told you, get rid of 10% of the cost. What do you do? You go down the hall and you get rid of Mary or Joe. And they look up at you and say, why me? And the leader says, well, you weren't very good. Well, they say, I've been here 31 years. Why haven't anybody ever told me? That's cruel. That's cruel. Your job is to keep building people. Make your place the most exciting place that everybody in the company is trying to come work for you because they know you're going to promote people. You love it, and people are going to steal your best people. 
This is a career route. So get that generosity gene in your heart. It's so important. It is the key to building great teams. Really powerful, Jack. Really. So, in, you know, you've had the opportunity to uh, watch business and observe it for many decades. Uh, what do you see has remained the same and what's changed? Well, the same is clearly best player wins. Never forget that. Uh, that's probably the most long-lasting thing there is in the game. Get smart people, energize them, excite them, and go. What is obviously much, much changed is the speed. I mean, everything is in microseconds now. So you can't lag. You've got to flatten all organizations. Everybody knows everything now. Uh, being a boss is not power because everybody knows everything. Being a boss is you turning people on, not having a little more knowledge than they have because they all know everything. And so speed, information flow is everywhere. Everyone knows everything. You've got to be more transparent than ever before because there are no secrets. Everybody knows everything. And of course, globalization. It's a global game. There's a competitor around every corner every morning. And you've got to get your organization looking outside itself. Organizations, as they grow, tend to look inside. They tend to look at the politics, the promotions, the layers, and they, and they study themselves. The action is all outside. Not just the normal competitor, the competitor you don't know about, who's coming around the corner the other way with a new idea. So there's an enormous speed, information flow, and getting bureaucracy out of institutions is ever more important. You've got to beat it out of the company. Flatter, faster is the two words, two Fs, flatter and faster for every organization. That's Just phenomenal. One, I, I would add one thing to that, um, and we write about it in one of the chapters in the book, is that um, there are all sorts of new and exciting ways to market now, right? There's just, you know, the, the customer experience is, has, uh, it used to be sort of advertised on TV or in magazines, and now we all know there's so many different ways to reach the customer, and so you can get very, very caught up in marketing what you do, but I think what's true, what was true 200 years ago and 20 years ago, and it's gonna be true two, 20 years from now and 20 years from now, is that the ultimate killer app is a great idea is a great product or a great service. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't market something that's mediocre to the point where it's sustainable. So you've got to keep in mind, it really all begins and ends with a fantastic idea. And that's always been true. So over this incredibly brilliant career, Jack, uh, do you have any regrets? How could I have regrets? I'm the luckiest guy alive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but if there's one lesson I think I've learned, and I think you all know, uh, I probably experienced the same thing. Have you ever said, I wish I waited six months to do something? It doesn't happen. Faster act. If it doesn't work, change it and fix it. But act. Move faster, faster, faster. On every decision, on people, on acquisitions, on technology, on investing, faster, faster, faster. There is no time, there is no room here in this game today for caution. Great. So, uh, you know, David Brooks, a columnist, uh, talked about living for your obituary uh, versus living for your resume. Uh, what would you uh, like to see your legacy? I, I, the, the, the word bores me. It's a nonsense word. I mean, what I, wanted, what I tried to do all my life was to make our team winners and get all the fruits of winning. More money, more praise, more excitement, feeling better about themselves. And I think that if there's an achievement I have, it's lots of people like you who became very successful for hanging around with us. And that to me is everything. And I, legacy is a bore. I like that, I like that. Never stop. So Jack, I have a few more questions from the yeah, audience, and yeah, you have a little bit of time. Uh, so uh, one of the questions was, how can Silicon Valley 
help the Rust Belt participate in the boom we're seeing here? That's a great question. That's a great question. And without, and, and, and you already are. I mean, there's no question that company after company is being impacted in getting faster by some of the tools that are developed here. But in the end, you, the, the cadence here is so far beyond what's there. All you can do, you're not going to change the cultures there, but you can change them by changing their relative competitiveness by companies that adopt the products that are here, that are giving them, what's that competitive advantage? Speed, action, etc. When you can do that, bring, help them bring my products to market faster, have, having them with better sales tool, tools like salesforce.com and other things, make them more globally competitive. That's the best thing you can do. Their culture would take half a century to get to the culture that's here. You're not going to change that overnight. Great. Um, one other question that we had was about uh, com completely renewing yourself constantly. And it reminded me of a story you'd shared back in the past that uh, every time you came back from an international trip, you pretended that this was your first day as CEO and the guy before you was a dud. Yeah. And so you would go in and say, okay, now how can I do things differently? How do you keep renewing yourself? Well, you marry a young wife. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Susie, how do you keep renewing Jack? <laughs> <laughs> Jack is, uh, Jack is so young, I often refer to him as a 14-year-old boy, and I think that what, what drives him is this unbelievable desire to learn. I mean, just to learn every day. And wh whether or not you can um, develop that trait in yourself or whether you're born with it, I don't know. But this insatiable curiosity, I mean, one of the things that I can count on 100% is when Jack and I arrive in any country, um, say we, uh, like for instance, we went to Slovakia uh, for a speaking engagement, and I always sort of pity the person who's driving the car from the airport to the hotel because Jack is going to suck that person's brain out of his ears <laughs> by asking him every question about his life and the state of Slovakia until the guy drops us off and his tongue is hanging out of his mouth and he's exhausted and he, he doesn't know what's hit him. Um, uh, but this incredible um, curiosity to know what's making things happen and why, that I think is the engine um, that keeps the, uh, keeps the little uh, powerhouse churning. So. And I find things like India. In, in, India is my invention, if you will, for me. I mean, I've, I found India and I thought it was, as I said, a low-cost production facility. And it never really was that. It was all about brain power. And that was a huge learning. And I, and I told everyone in America that story a thousand times. You, you, you went there for cost and you found intellect. That was a, that for me was like an invention, like Thomas Edison, the light bulb. I mean, that was an invention to me. I didn't know that. <laughs> Well, we're out of time, Jack. We'll Thank go you. on forever. It's a privilege, Susie and Jack, Thank to you. have you here at Tycon. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.